Hello and welcome to our review of Tapestry, a civilization building game from Stonemeyer Games. And while I know he won't listen to this, thanks Jamie for letting us pick up a review copy of your game. So Tapestry was designed by Jamie Stegmeyer. It features artwork by Andrew Bosley and sculptures by Ron Brown. It was published in North America by Stonemaier Games in 2019. Now, a game of Tapestry plays one to five players, with games taking around two hours on average, though it is dependent on the player count and player experience. Now, I will have to say Tapestry is not cheap. It has a manufactured suggested retail price of $99 US. The once you see the quality of the components used in this game, that price becomes much more palatable. This is a game that has a real amazing table presence and not in a flashy draw attention way mm -hmm. we often talk about when playing in public, but it really feels impressive to those playing it. Yeah. And the components are a strong part of the value in this game, but that's not to ignore the massive replayability you get in this box. Totally agree. Now, Tapestry is a civilization building board game featuring only two actions each round available for each player. You either collect income and enter the next era for your evolving civilization, or you move up on one of four progress tracks, which include exploration, technology, science, or military. Now, moving up these tracks is what makes the game interesting, and by doing so, you'll do all kinds of things like expanding your civilization, conquering territories on the map, inventing technologies, completing research, building your capital city, and more. Now, this game features some of the best components that we've seen in a board game, so you mm -hmm. should really see this for yourself in our Tapestry, the unboxing video on YouTube. Now, there is a ton of stuff in this box. All of it, honestly, was better quality than I expected. Like, I knew this game was well-produced. Everyone's probably heard just how impressive Tapestry looks. I saw all the hype about just how impressive it was myself, but I was still surprised by many elements I hadn't heard about. Like everyone's heard about the 3D buildings, right? Everyone's seen the 3D buildings, everyone's seen the pictures, but there's more to it than that. Things like the fact the game has a box insert with a lid to hold those three-dimensional landmarks to make sure they don't get damaged. The other part is those landmarks are not pre-painted, they're actually printed in multiple colors. The way all the player boards are actually textured, they kind of feel like a low grit sandpaper and that's to prevent things from sliding around on them. A good alternative to a double-sided board, which would have cost way more. The quality of all the buildings on the individual player houses are really cool. And the outposts aren't just cubes. Um, even the material the rule book is printed on is a step above what you'd expect in a modern board game. All right. Well, how will you tell us what we do with all these fancy components? All right. So learning to play tapestry can be kind of interesting. The actual rule book for this game is four pages long. Literally, that's it. Four pages. And they're not like really small font. Now, the reason for that is the actual rules are very simple. Each term, you have two choices. It's the implementation of those choices that can lead to the complexity and weight of this game. Well, even though we've talked about struggling with the Tabletopia implementation mm -hmm. of the game, that had nothing to do with the difficulty of the game play or the rules. That was right. the easy part. True. Now, you start a game by putting the board on the table. It's got two sides. You use whichever side's appropriate for your player count. Everyone's going to take a player board and fill it up with the various building types. So there's four different building types, markets, houses, farms, and armories. You put them on different tracks. And then you're going to grab four resource tokers, trackers, tokers, trackers, one for food, money, culture, and one for workers. You put those all at zero. Players are then dealt two random civilizations, which are these big cards, and then one or two capital city mats. Uh, that's based on the number of players. If you're playing with four or five players, you just get one. If you're playing with less, you actually get a pick between each, be between two. Uh, two of your outposts are placed onto your starting island. Tracking cubes are placed at the start of each of those progress tracks I mentioned and at the start of the victory point check. Now you're going to shuffle the cards that come in the game. You have tech cards and tapestry cards. You're going to put those face down by the board, and you're going to deal out three tech cards to a market. Now, the rest of the materials, like exploration tiles, space tiles, landmark boards, and landmarks and everything are just put beside the board, kind of set up so it's in reach of everyone. So there is a good deal of setup in this, but it pays off, and there's mm -hmm. enough game here so that you're not annoyed by spending a long time setting up relative to the time you spend playing. 
Next, players are going to adjust their starting materials based on the civilization they chose. Also, be sure to check the civilization advancement sheet for any changes that have made to that civilization since the game was published. Now, this is something that's been added to the game since it came out. There will be a copy in your copy of the game if you pick it up now, and you can always go online to check for the most updated version. Now, the current version was last updated in March 2021. That's of today on August 5th. Now, this is something that can't be ignored. Check online. This is, albeit in a minor way, a living game. Yes. Now, you got everything set up. On your turn, each player is going to do one of two things. I mentioned this a few times. Those two things are collect income or advance. So income or advance, pick one or the other. Since no one has any resources at the start of the turn, start of the game, you're going to start by taking an income turn. So I'm going to describe that one first. So each income turn, you go through four steps. First, you're going to look at your civilization board and activate any during your income phase abilities. These are widely varied. I'm not going to get into what they do. Note you skip this turn one. Next, you're going to take a tapestry card and you're going to put it down in the next era. Now, if you don't have one in your hand, you're going to draw a random one. Now, if you are the first of your neighbors to do this, you get a bonus because you're the first civilization that's getting into the next era and you get a bonus for doing this now note again this is skip turn one you automatically everyone develops fire the first civilization turn okay so i think listeners might appreciate a bit of clarity here what exactly yeah. is a tapestry card so this ties into the theme of the game these are what was written about your civilization at that time it's what was woven into the tapestry that's the history of your civilization and there's a variety of different cards and they all are going to give you either an instant bonus where right now you get a thing or they're going to put an effect into play for the entire era there are tons of these there's a significant deck an example is dictatorship you pick one of the four tracks you go up on it once and get the bonus no one else can go up on that track until your next turn that's one of them Another one is called the trap card. Now you can play that as a tapestry card and get 10 points, which is a huge bonus, or you can hold on to it and you can reveal it if someone attacks you and you end up defeating them instead of you them defeating you. And there are a ton of these. There, there's diplomacy, there's uh, revolution, there's exploitation. There are a ton of tapestry cards. Next, you will upgrade one of your technology cards and gain victory points. So what you're going to do is take any of your technology cards, you're going to move it up one level, they're placed on the side of your board, and gain the appropriate reward. Now, each tech card can only be advanced twice. We'll get into how you get those in a minute. Now, victory points are gained based on what is currently showing on your player board, which, again, will be nothing at the start of your game, so everything's covered up. Think of games like Terra Mystica or Clans of Caledonia, where you're uncovering things on your board to see what your income is. Later, points are going to be earned for things like the number of technology cards you have having complete rows and columns of buildings on your capital map, advancing on the farm track, and controlling territories on the board. Now, these scoring opportunities are unlocked by getting your buildings into play from your player mat into your capital city. The next thing you're going to do is collect income. Again, there are four resources in the game, money, food, workers, and culture. Each income phase, you'll gain a number of each based on, again, how many income symbols are showing on your player board which again are unlocked by playing buildings from your player board onto your map. So certainly simple enough, not a huge number of differing resources or options to really muddy the waters right. in your discussions. Now, your first income phase of the first turn is going to be really basic. You're just going to collect one of every resource, one trap is to your card, and one exploration token, and that's it, unless your civilization modifies that in some way. Every future one, though, is going to be a big kind of involved process. Now, instead of doing an income phase, you can instead choose the advance action. What you're doing here is you're going to choose one of the four tracks on the board, one of the four progress tracks of warfare, exploration, technology, or science, pay the cost and resources for the next spot on that track, move your cube, your tracking cube to the next spot, and then take the action indicated there. Then you'll have the option to complete any bonus actions that are on that spot. Now, this is where things get interesting with all kinds of options, like way too much for me to cover here. Each track has 12 different spots on it, each of which is totally unique. Now, some are similar, especially earlier on the track, like take a tapestry card and optionally build a building. That's on all four of the tracks, actually, usually in the third spot, see the second or third spot. But most of the actions other than those are completely different. 
And some have options like build the building or conquer. Some are build the building and conquer and so on. Now, what I will do here is I'll talk in general about each of the track types and the types of actions they provide, but there's nowhere I'm going to describe every action in the game. And I do have to thank Jamie for including a sheet that summarizes all of this in one place. Now, to be clear, while we can't discuss them all, that's because of sheer volume, yeah. not the complexity. You'll become quite familiar with the iconography quickly, and those reference sheets Mo mentioned are there to help. And once you've got some strategy ideas in mind, you'll often find less trouble than you think making a choice and deciding where you're going to be going. The other thing I do appreciate about these tracks is for teaching the game, as long as you don't have a hardcore player that wants to win their first game, you can just generally tell them what the next step is on every track, every turn. So now you're here, here, and here. Here's what the next step is here. Here's what the next step here and there and there. And then the next turn, you just tell them what new one they've reached. That way you don't have to explain the entire game from the start of it. So starting with the exploration track, this is about building farms, collecting exploration tiles, and expanding the game map. Now, the one of the most common actions on this track is the explore action that will let you place one of those tiles onto the board and grow the map. You're going to get bonus points for doing this based on how well it matches up to the tiles that are already there, and you're going to get some form of resource for placing the tile. Now, this is usually one of the four resources, but could be the ability to build a building excuse me, the ability to build a building or gain a tapestry card or level up a technology. Now the technology track, this is all about building markets and inventing technologies. Now, when you invent a technology, you place it next to your capital city map. It does nothing for you until you're able to advance it. And you don't get to advance technologies in general until the income phase, though there are spots further down the technology track that will let you advance them during a normal turn. Now, each technology contains two rewards. One you get after advancing it the first time, and another one that's only earned if you advance the same tech again. Now, for that highest level, they call it they're in squares. To do that, there's always also a requirement. This is going to be based on either how many buildings you or your neighbors have built, or how far you or your neighbors are up on different progress tracks. Now, I've mentioned neighbors a couple times, but that actually means it's the player to your left and right. So similar to games like Seven Wonders, you're more worried about what the players to your left and right are doing compared to players across from you. Now, the next track is the military track. This is all about building armories and, of course, conquering territory. Now, to conquer a territory is really simple. This isn't like any complex war game. You just take one of your outposts and put it on a tile adjacent to one you control. You then roll the military dice and pick a reward. Now, if there is an enemy outpost there, you topple it. You just set it on its side. Now, each tile can only ever hold two outposts, so there can only ever be one fight in each hex on the board. And again, it's not even really a fight. You just win. If you conquer, you do it. Unless someone has one of those trap cards I mentioned earlier. Finally, we have the science track. This one is huge, interesting because, for one, you'll be placing houses. But more than that is you are going to get to roll this science die. And what that does is advance you on one of these four tracks randomly between the four of them. Now, when you first start advancing on science, you're going to get to go up on a track for free, but you don't get the reward for doing so. But as you get further down the science track, you're going to get to start to roll that die and be able to get the bonuses or advance on multiple tracks claiming all the rewards. If you get up high enough on the science track, there's even a spot that lets you turn back time. All right, so just because we've seen a lot of people talking about how this isn't a Civ game, we can reiterate exploration, technology, military, income. I think the only thing may, may be missing is, I don't know, building a capital city? Well, see, when you advance on these tracks, you're also going to get the opportunity to build buildings. Uh, as I mentioned, when you're doing the different ones, you get to build different types of buildings, like exploration, you build farms, the technology track, you build markets, the military track, you build armies, armories, and the science track, you're building houses. What this actually means when you're playing is you're going to take a building from your player board and put it on your capital city map. Now, not only does this let you fill up your capital city map, which is important for scoring, but it also uncovers those spots on your player board, leading to more income and more scoring abilities. Now, you can also grow your capital city map from the advancement of certain technology cards and by collecting landmarks. Now, each of the four tracks on the board is broken up into three sections, three each. 
The first player to advance to like level two in a section gets a free building. The first person to advance to level three on that track will get a free building. And the first person to advance to level four will get a free building. These are large buildings. They take up a minimum of a two by two area on your grid up to a total of, I think one is like four by two by three. There are some huge buildings here. This tends to be great for filling in your mat which is good for completing rows and columns for victory points, as well as filling in three by three areas, which gives you free resources. So there we go. Not only a city, but a, Soku, a Sudoku reminiscent aspect to building it in stages. Yes. Now, additionally, victory points can also by, be earned by completing three achievements that are always in play. Uh, one is getting to the end of the progress tracks, first person to get to an end of a progress track, then second person to get to an end of a progress track, and possibly third, depending on how many players you're playing with. Conquering the center of the map is worth points for the first person there and then the second. I get, no third person could go there because the whole rules with the outposts. Speaking of toppling outposts, there's also one for the first person to topple two opponents' outposts and for the second person to do so. The game continues with each player going income or advance until everyone has collected income five times. Now, it's interesting to note that players don't have to take income at the same time. One player's civilization could be in era number one still, while someone else is in era three. And this is by design and intentional. The choice of when to take income and advance to the next era is an important part of the strategy and tapestry. And it's also possible for players to be done playing while other players still need to finish up. One thing this game really allows is, in a meta sense, telling strange stories of development with some civilizations mm -hmm. surging forward, others languishing, tales of battles and technology paths far different than what we are used to on a more linear games stuck in how things have happened here on Earth. Now, once all players have taken their fifth income action, the game ends, the player with the most points wins. To me, that's shocking because most Euro games then have some kind of scoring phase or something. There's nothing. You don't get anything at the end. Once you've done your fifth income, that's your score. Sits there at the end of the game. There's just no end game scoring. Though players can still earn a significant portion of their points in that last income phase. There's usually a rather large surge. And most people I played it with are like, oh, there's no way anyone's getting 100 points. And then they play a game where they get 300 because it does ramp up. Yeah, planning for that end game should start early and will be part of what guides your selections and your path through the game, of course, based on the civilization that you started with. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to these multiplayer rules, the game also includes a solo variant, which uses two bots, and then another variant where you can use one of those two bots in a two-player game. Now, both bots use an interesting card-based action system to determine what tracks they advance on and when they do advance, what they advance on. The automata, automa, at, automa, I don't know how the proper way it's, it's not automata, it's automa or automa, automa? Automa, I would guess. Probably automa. So the automa bot acts as an opponent for solo play. If Fitch features a very simplified action system, each round it's going to go up one track, it's going to claim any landmarks it earns, and then it's going to take that action. But only certain actions will the bot do, which includes conquering, exploring, rolling the science die, clearing the tech cards, and collecting tapestry cards. All other actions, building buildings, all that skip. They don't do that. Now, in each income phase, the Atoma scores points for the number of landmarks it's collected, the territory it controls on the board, and how far it's progressed up each track. So it will be interesting to see if licensed digital versions of the game merge, since the bot play seems to really lend itself to mechanization. Mm -hmm. I could see this going very well, for instance, on BGA. See, we tried it on BGA. I have no idea if there was a solo mode integrated on there or not. Oh, well, we tried, Might we tried be worth a on Tabletopia, you mean. Oh, sorry, Tabletopia. Yeah. I always, sorry, yes. <laughs> Would go really well on Brookie Marine. Now, the other bot is the, called the Shadow Empire. It's kind of there just to make things happen that might not otherwise. So each turn, this bot progresses up one track. It is still going to collect landmark buildings. So basically, it can steal buildings from players. It can also claim the reach the end of the track achievement, but doesn't get any points for it. So the Shadow Empire actually can't score points and can't win the game. Now, in solo games, the Shadow Empire's outpost can end up on the board, but that's just part of how the Atoma conquers. 
I, it, you can't win. So even when playing solo, it's either you, you or a Toma win. And if playing two player with the Shadow Empires, a human always wins. Well, now that we have a good idea of how to play Tapestry, how about we get into some of your opinions on the game? All right, let's start with, for some reason, seems to be the problem everyone has with this game. There was a huge media blitz when Tapestry hit the market back in 2019. This is one of the few games where they actually had people hold back their reviews and release them all on the same day. And that day, I'm sorry to say that all of the news was not positive. Well, everyone seemed to love the components. Everyone was hyped by how cool the game looked. The gameplay turned off a number of people. And a big part of this were people claiming that Tapestry is not a civilization game. This is an opinion, I, I don't understand it. I really don't. Like, obviously, when people hear the term civilization game, they must get some idea in their head of about what to expect. What is a Civ game to them? I'm assuming these ideas are driven by the original Amazon, Amazon? Avalon Hill civilization game, which the popular video game everyone knows and loves, Sid Saxon. Sid, Sid, I can't even talk now. Sid, it's not even Sid Saxon. Sid but Myers. Sid Myers. Thank you. Wow. Sorry, <laughs> ideas that are driven by the original Avalon Hill Civilization game, which the popular video game is based on, or more modern civilization building games like Clash of Cultures or Through the Ages or the new version of Through the Ages, whatever that one's called. Um, people seem to expect that the game will play like those games and follow a timeline that's similar to the one we went through, like what humanity did in real life. The thing is, Tapestry doesn't do either of these. It doesn't try to recreate those games, and it doesn't follow our existing timeline. It's a different kind of civilization game. It's an anachronistic one. In this game, you're leading a civilization, one that can evolve into something more over time. You're going to be inventing technologies and improving them. You're progressing on four different tracks representing the key civ building elements of exploration, science, technology, and warfare. You build up your capital city and in so doing, complete developments that will increase your income and your ability to generate more points and resources. You're going to expand your territory by exploring and conquering. You're going to conquer the territory held by other players. You can exploit territories and play for resources. Like to me, these are all the staples of civilization games. It's just being done in a new and interesting way. Yeah, While I, moving a brown building from your player board to your gridded capital city Sudoku light board might be what you're doing mechanically, thematically, this represents the development of farming and the growing value of your capital. Yes, this game, your civilization that just developed fire may take the transistor technology card, but as I said, this game's anachronistic. It's not meant to represent any current civilization's progress through history, but rather a variant one. Plus, to be honest, taking a tech card to me always just seemed to indicate your society was thinking about that thing. Like, no, your cavemen aren't thinking about transistors, but maybe they've dug up the appropriate metals that will eventually develop into transistor technologies. The, the first step is just the, the basic thoughts of it. It takes advancing attack to actually get the benefits. And honestly, for those transistors, I don't think you get them until you hit that four stage, which requires someone in the game to hit level four in technology before you can do it, which to me makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I just, I don't understand the confusion. It, it's a 4X game. Yeah. <laughs> if, if a 4X game isn't a Civ game, I don't know what is. <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I'm still baffled. I saw someone say it today. I shared a picture of Tapestry on my Twitter account today and someone came in with a, just didn't feel like a Civ game to me. And I'm like, well, what is a Civ game to you? Like we may have to do an entire topic on our podcast about what is a Civ game just so we can talk about it. And I'd love to hear other people's opinions to explain why this isn't fun. So let's throw out a whoop. Let's forget it. Let's don't, don't, it's not a Civ game for the rest of the review. Whatever you, whatever makes you happy. We're going to toss that out and take a look at the game on its own merits. So ever since our first game, I have had a lot of fun discovering Tapestry. And that's what Tapestry feels like every time I play it, is a journey of discovery. I'm always trying different things. I'm experiencing different civilizations. I'm figuring out which tracks work best with the others and what pairs work. I'm discovering which technologies synchronize with what strategies. I'm learning just how important filling your capital city can be and how much that can mean and so much more. 
And there's really such a variance between civilizations, which is, as we discussed earlier, part of why this is a living game. Uh, they are adjusting things as they go to balance mm -hmm. the civilizations. But you can play a very different game depending on who you're starting as. Yes. I'm also really impressed by how Jamie was able to distill the mechanics of a big, pretty complicated game to four pages. But to be honest, it's that simple. Gain income and enter the next stage or progress on one of the four tracks. That's it. That's all you need to know. Now, the decision of what track to advance, when to advance on it, how far to advance, when you should take income, and all of that is what gives this game its weight and complexity. And added to these is the complexity of having to look at what your opponents are doing and react based on that. Well, the basic options are simple. It's what to do with them, there's not. There are a ridiculous number of ways you can play this game. And so far, we have found a number of very valid strategies getting you to real um, victory points. Yeah, it, it's, it's the difference between writers and RPG writers designing a manual versus a board game designer who has designed a nice tight game yeah. writing the manual of this is how you play. Figure out the rest in, as you play. Yeah, in a way. Now, I will admit that there's kind of a cheat here, like the rule book's four pages, but then there are multiple sheets to reference to find out what some of the things do. I would actually say that the the, pay, the, the rule book is actually six pages, because I think you have to count those two reference pages as part of the rules of the game, because you'll never figure it out otherwise. But yeah, I, but even that, six pages, like this, if this was a fantasy flight game, I'd expect 34 pages to try to explain all of this stuff, explaining what every different little box does. Now, added to this, in the base game, oh, I might have this wrong. I think I checked it. I, I, this may be with the expansion. I apologize. I think this is right. There are 16 different civilizations presented in the game. Now, with five players playing, that gives you 4,368 different possible starting civilization combinations. Now, that's a huge number. Now, added to that, there are multiple ways in the game to add a civilization to one of the players. So once you throw that in, that number just grows exponentially. Due to this, like, that's great that this variation is awesome, right? Like, it, it, it's, it, it's very cool that there's that many combinations. But the problem is, there is no way no one possibly could try every possible combination. And because of that, the civilizations aren't perfectly balanced. Not even close, I would say. Now, to address this, Jamie has created that civilization adjustment document I mentioned earlier which seems to do a pretty good job of fixing any serious balance issues. Now, this doesn't actually do the nice thing where, like, if you're playing this Civ versus this Civ, change it. Everything's kept generic, so it's simple. Like, you start the game and just take some extra points or take an extra resource or ignore this ability the first turn, that kind of stuff. Now, this is a living document, too, and this has been updated three times so far. And as more people play Tapestry and let people know, let Jamie know how it's gone, I expect this document to change. Now, to help with this, after a game of Tapestry, you can go to Stonemeyer's website and log your play. And I highly recommend that everyone playing do this because it benefits all of us who enjoy the game, as well as potentially improving the game for anyone new to it. Now, one thing that's really interesting is the sheer number of combinations here mean that it's really difficult to become an expert in the game. Mm -hmm. Some of those players who just want to be, you know, find that ideal strategy, not only may be thwarted by the living up rules update, but also may be thwarted by the fact that their opponents aren't choosing civilizations that they're used to playing with, thus changing mm -hmm. the entire layout of how people are going to play things. Because mm -hmm. I learned how to play with civilization X and I can always beat civilizations A and B. But if I'm playing Civilization X and they're playing Civilizations Q and Y, it's a whole different game. So you 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 lose the you lose the ability to kind of uh, force force people into into situations because they just would never play that way with a given civilization. And each civilization makes the game so asymmetric that I don't think there's an overall tapestry strategy that you can use with every civilization. And if there is, someone may have discovered it, but I'm not seeing that at all. It, you, you have to change how you are playing based on the ability you're given with your civilization. 
moving on, as already mentioned, production quality is top notch. Um, I love how tactile everything is. Like this game not only looks good, it, it honestly feels good. Um, I could say more, but honestly, the physicality of this game has been covered by pretty much every reviewer out there and people who own copies of the game and everyone who's got an Instagram account who has played this. So I think we've, we've probably heard enough about the actual tactileness and the production quality. And uh, unfortunately, I still haven't had my hands on it. That'll be uh, in a week or so. Soon, soon. Now, another thing that I really like here is Tapestry is one of those games along with some of my other favorites, like Terraforming Mars, where at the end of the game, I feel like I built something. I accomplished something. I built something from the ground up. To me, that feeling is more rewarding than, and more important than winning a game. These are the type of games that have me coming back for more. That's why Terraforming Mars was my most played game from last year. I love playing that game just to see, oh, this time I went with this and I did this and I managed to win with this or I managed to not put a tile on the board or I did this thing. And Tapestry does that as well. Like score-wise, to be honest, I am terrible at this game. I have come dead last every time I played, except for that I did kind of beat out deep playing against the Atoma, but we each had different civilizations, so who knows? But yeah, I I'm, seem to be terrible at the game, but I have enjoyed playing every single time. Excellent. And I, I had a, I had fun with the one digital play, uh, at least in concept. Again, we struggled with the uh, the interface, but I like the game enough to know that I want to sit down mm -hmm. and play the game for real. Now, the other thing I will say is I have enjoyed this game at every player count, uh, though I will say five is a bit longer than I would have liked. Um, there's a lot of downtime between turns. Uh, AP can also be an issue. Um, the other thing is the, the full player count also increases the odds that one or more players is going to finish playing before the others and have to wait out till the end, which honestly, like anytime we've had it, it was like one or two more rounds. It wasn't a big wait, but because it does have player elimination, the more players, the more chance someone might be kind of sitting watching till the end. Right. Now tapestry players on board game geek claim this game is best at three. And honestly, I disagree with that. I liked it the most at four. And the reason for that are the neighbor rules. I mentioned before neighbor rules come up when taking income, uh, moving to the next era, and when trying to advance your technologies to that third level. With three or fewer players, everyone's your opponent and your neighbor. But once you get to four or five, there's going to be one or two other players who, while still your opponents, aren't your neighbors, and I like that interaction. There's just something I liked about that that made it feel good that I didn't have to worry about what you were doing, and I had to watch what they were doing. And then I'd see, like, oh, you advanced which means she's probably going to advance next. So I might want to advance before she does. I just, I liked the, 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 the thought process that went into that. Yeah. But you don't get to the full level of seven wonders where no. you're struggling to pay attention with some, what everyone at the table is doing, but it just becomes pointless to look at what the player way over there is doing. Yeah. Seven wonders. The only thing I ever bothered tracking is technologies. That's the only one. Other than that, I don't pay any attention to anyone but my neighbors. And only if I'm trying to collect technologies. I did not have that problem at all here. The one that shocked me is how well this game played two players. Um, I honestly cannot think of another 4X style game that plays this well at two. Like we tried Eclipse with two and it was okay, but it wasn't great. And that was without using the Shadow Empire bot which could improve a two-player game because what it does is it's something else in play that will snatch up landmarks before the players basically split them evenly. When we played two players, I will admit it was like, I'm going to go up these two tracks, you're going to go up those two tracks, and we kind of ignored each other instead of being in direct conflict. But it did work. I was even more surprised how much I actually enjoyed playing this game solo. I am definitely not a big solo board gamer, but it was quite fun on my own. And I actually think playing solo might be a great way to explore the different civilizations. Like just to improve your overall gameplay, sit down and play solo against Atoma and the Shadow Empire and try each of the different civilizations. Though there are some they don't recommend using in that particular format. It's interesting that they give you that that flexibility so that while no, we as we've said, you're not going to gain system mastery, you can get more comfort, you know, find mm -hmm. find the civilization that you are more comfortable with. Yeah. And to be honest, by the rules, you're supposed to give them out randomly, but there's no reason not to give sean his favorite civ every time he plays unless he wins every time and then <laughs> i'd still want to give it to him and try to beat him so overall i think it's pretty obvious so far in the review uh we dig tapestry everyone we've taught this game to has enjoyed it as well uh we have one fred considering it one of their favorite board games of all time 
I've enjoyed every single play of Tapestry, both with new and experienced players so far. No, experienced players aren't people who have played 20 times. That's We're still in the middle of a bit of a pandemic here. So I haven't gotten to play with any Tapestry experts, but everyone we played with has had a fun, and I've enjoyed playing with them. It's got amazing production quality, and it features gameplay that leaves you feeling like you accomplished something, whether you win or lose, which I think is a huge feature of this game. Now, if you dig 4X style games that feature things like progressing on tracks, exploring, conquering, and developing technologies with variable player powers and asymmetry, you're going to love Tapestry. Just leave any preconceived notions about what's a sim building game, what isn't at the door, sit down and enjoy the game. Now, one big advantage Tapestry does have over popular sim building games is it's much shorter. Even at five players with experienced players, you should be able to finish a game in under two hours. And it's much less complex than most big, heavy, long, epic Civ games with a weight of only 2.88 on BoardGameGeek. So due to this, even if epic 4X game nights kind of scare you, you might want to give Tapestry a try because it's a distilled version, shorter experience. Now, if you are out there looking for the next big Civ game, the next Clash of Cultures, the new Through the Ages, the new Sid Meier Civilization 12, you're not going to find that here. Tapestry is a very different type of civilization game. Now, I do still recommend giving it a shot, but don't go in expecting the same experience you've had with other Civ builders. Well, that's it for our review of Tapestry. I invite you to also check out Mo's written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. 